Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We're glad to see this number out for our Sunday morning Bible study period here with the Cartersville Church of Christ. We appreciate so much the attendance of the regular number here at Cartersville. If we have any visitors amongst us, we always are grateful for visitors. We encourage you to come back when you have an opportunity. And if you don't mind filling out a visitor's card that you'll find there on one of the pews and dropping it in the collection plate when it comes around later, we would appreciate that. Doug has something that is a supplemental thing to our bulletin this morning. If, by the way, if you haven't gotten a copy of our bulletin, they are out there on the rack as you go out in the, the foyer on the right. But Doug has made up some copies of the Congregational Evangelism Seminar schedule. If you would like to be able to have a schedule of that, they're out there next to the, the uh, outline and bulletin this morning. So feel free to grab one. Let me go ahead and start with that since I've already mentioned it. It's coming up this Friday, Saturday, and next Sunday, April 19th through the 21st. Our guest speaker, which he's not really going to be much of a guest, we, he's home folks, Charles Harris, and is going to be speaking. And there's also going to be a special ladies session on Sunday when Anna's going to speak to the ladies. So if you have not already made your plans for next, or this upcoming weekend and next Sunday, please be making your plans to be here. And this will help you to have a, a copy of all the times and what's going to be taking place on the certain dates. All right, if you at any time today need a nursery while you're with us, go to the foyer and take a right. It is at the end of the hall. I did not give our worship hours and Bible class hours earlier. I'll do that now. We do have Bible classes on Sunday morning, 10 a.m. Bible classes Wednesday night, 7.30 p.m. Our worship hours today are 11 a.m. and 6 p.m. Kids Sing will precede our evening worship, which is a program we do with our young folks. All right, here's the sick list that I have that's updated, and if you... Have a bulletin. Don't forget those individuals that need our prayers to mention there as well. Donna Bass is not with us this morning. Sister Donna posted on Facebook. She has a migraine. She's going to be streaming this morning. Sister Linda Gayton is at home. Please remember Sister Linda. Bobby posted yesterday that she's been running a fever and having earaches. So please remember Linda. Also, Brenda Brake needs our prayers. This is the niece of Jerry Bohannon. Sadly, she had a heart attack on Wednesday. We hope that she will be okay. Trina Bell is not here this morning. She's not feeling well. Brianna Bailey, this is the granddaughter that we've been mentioning for a while now of Isabel Bailey. She now has surgery scheduled for April the 22nd, which is next, not tomorrow, but the Monday after. Uh, her cancer sadly has spread from what they've learned, so please remember her in your prayers. Brother Jeff Tompkins is going to an orthopedic appointment tomorrow in Rome, so please remember Jeff. We hope that everything goes well there. And also, Bobby and Myra Williams have asked us to remember a friend of theirs named Ken Bright. Sadly, Mr. Bright has been diagnosed with brain cancer. I'm sorry to, that that is the case. The Parkers are out of town today. They are visiting over in Alabama. Shelly is still in Tennessee, but if everything goes well this morning, she's going to be back this afternoon. She was going to wake up and see how she felt, and if she felt well enough to go to worship, she was going to worship this morning up there, and then she would come home this afternoon. Uh, I've joked around that the cats may need, are probably tired of looking at me. They want to look at somebody else. So uh, it's been two weeks since, uh, this, since she left on Tuesday, if you can believe that. And thankfully, I still have clean, enough clean clothes that I could get dressed this morning. No, I, Shelly does a lot of good, but she knows as well as I do that uh, I can make it if necessary for a while. And we're grateful, though, that she's coming home. I've missed her terribly. All right, gospel meeting coming up. April the 21st through the 24th, that is next week, hosted by the MLK Congregation in Adairsville. David Wyke is the guest preacher. Two ladies' days, both next Saturday. All right, hold on. Not this Saturday, but April the 27th, which would be the next Saturday. And one of them is at Riverbend. Tiffany Gaines will be speaking there. And another is at West Oregon. And I'm not sure about who their speaker is. They did not put it on the flyer. The L.J. Congregation is having what they call a Spring Revival, April the 28th through May the 1st. You're invited to that. And if I'm not mistaken, that's all that I have so far. If there are any other announcements that need to be made, please let us know and we'll take care of that before our worship hour. All right, let's pray together and we'll get started with our study. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We're grateful to Thee, Father, to be able to call upon Thee and know that our prayers are heard and answered. We praise Thee as the great I Am, the true and living God. We beg Thy forgiveness, Father. We know that we sin. We're grateful for Thy mercy and love and grace. We're thankful, Father, that the blood of Jesus continues to cleanse as we walk in the light. 
May we always have a penitent attitude when we fail thee and come back to thee with a desire and a motive to continue forward and be faithful. We pray this morning for those who have been mentioned who are sick. Donna Bass, Linda Gayton, Brenda Brake, Trina Bell, Brianna Bailey, Jeff Tompkins, and Ken Bright. We know that thou knowest each of their situations, and we pray, Father, that through thy providence they will have the things needful to help them move forward and be better. We are mindful as well, Father, for those who are grieving, who are bowed down in sorrow this hour. We pray that they will be able to find comfort through a study of thy word. May we as thy children do what we can to encourage them and help them to grieve properly so that they will not be overcome. We're mindful this morning of the situation over in the Middle East. We pray, Father, that as tensions continue to rise, that as little bloodshed as possible will take place, that those who are in the wrong will see what they are doing, have opportunity to repent. We trust Thee, Father, no matter what happens in this world. We realize and understand that as long as we are doing Thy will, that whatever happens here, we will be fine, and that we will be able one day to be with Thee in heaven. We pray on behalf of this congregation's elders. We're grateful, Father, for their leadership. We thank Thee, Father, for their families as well and their willingness to serve. We thank Thee for our deacons, for the works that they do in make, making sure that this congregation continues to do the things that we and get, and do on a regular basis here. We're mindful as well, though, of all members who do good works. We're thankful for every work, whatever it may be, as long as it is good in Thy sight. We continue to pray for doors to be open to us, that we can find more individuals out there who will receive the Word, have the opportunity to hide it in their hearts so that they may not sin against Thee. Father, we pray that the events coming up from our, with our sister congregations, the ladies' days, the meetings, we pray, Father, that those will be successful through Thy providence, that much good will come from them, and that more souls might be added to Thee. Father, we pray Thy will be done. May we accept it. May we always strive, Father, to bring Thee glory. In Jesus' name, amen. John chapter 14. John chapter 14. That is where we left off last week as we continue to harmonize the gospel accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John 14, 15, and 16. All three of those chapters are good to study together, not just because they are chapters one back from or on top of another, but because of the fact that this was a long discourse that our Lord had with his apostles. And we need to remember as we're studying that, that that's to whom he was originally speaking, not to us. He was talking to his original apostles, the original twelve. We left off last time talking about in verse 28, You have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. We know how that works. He's already explained that to them. Back in verse 17, he talked about the spirit of truth. Verse 26, the comforter, which is the Holy Spirit. That would be the way that even though Jesus physically was leaving them, the idea of coming again unto them, there would be a one like, just like him, one that's going to be an advocate for them, one that's going to plead their cause. In the situation, and that is what the original word means, paraclete. It means guide or pleader or advocate. He said, if you loved me, you would rejoice because I said I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. And we talked a little bit about that last week. And we understand again the... Godhead includes more than one. It's not just one in the Godhead. There is the Father, the Son, who was the Word, and the Holy Spirit. They are all God. They all possess the characteristics of deity. There is not more than one Godhead. There is only the one, and therefore we find that being mentioned there in verse 28. 29 now. And now I have told you before it come to pass, that when it is come to pass, you might believe. Again, he's preparing them. That's the whole point. He's letting them know what's going to happen before it ever happens. Obviously, being God, he is able to know all things, including the future. And he prepares them so that when the time does come, they will, he says, believe. This is an interesting comment here, because if you go back and you study the lives of these apostles, they had issues still. They had some growth still to do. And the outline, not the outline, but the article in the bulletin this week, 
is dealing with one of those individuals, Peter, and how he had growth still to do. And he talked about how the three times that he denied our Lord. So yes, he's trying to get them ready so that their faith will be strong, so that they will not be weak in this area. When the time comes, they will be prepared more for it. Hereafter, I will not talk much with you. Now, they've been able to hear him and see him for three years almost at this point in time. I can only imagine the great wealth of things that they have revealed to him that we don't even have mentioned in the Word that he was able to talk about on occasion with them that's not recorded. But it's coming to a point, and he's letting them know that he's not going to be with them much more to talk with them. I would try like a sponge to soak up every bit of time and every bit of teaching that he could give in the time that he was there. I would want to be with him as much as possible. And I'm sure in some ways that's the way they felt at times as well. But hereafter I will not talk much with you. He's about to end his earthly ministry. For the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. Who is the prince of this world to whom Jesus referred? That would be the devil, Satan, yes. He's also referred to as the prince of the power of the air in the New Testament. What was that now? Adversary. That's what the word Satan means, yes, adversary. And he was the one to whom Jesus was referring here. The prince of this world cometh, I think to a degree probably what he's getting at there is the idea that the influence of Satan was coming and is going to be placed upon, or that the deeds these men are going to do in having Jesus crucified and killed, that is obviously something that the, the devil would want to see done. I can only imagine on the day of crucifixion how the devil must have felt when Jesus died. I wonder if he thought, I won! Until, of course, Sunday came, or the first day of the week came, and then he realized, oh no, I lost. <laughs> you know, the devil's an interesting being. He's been whooped. Yes, that's a, that's a good Tennessee term, whooped. He's been whipped, whooped by the Lord, defeated by our Lord, and yet he still fights like he thinks he still can win. No, he knows he can't, but he wants to take as many with him. That's the mindset of the devil. There is nothing there that he's trying to give us that is good. He's wanting, since he is going to be cast or has been cast away from God, he wants as many of us to be that way. Which, to me, it, might, it reminds me of someone when they're punished, they, they, they want somebody else to get in trouble with them, that type of thing. So it's not just them suffering. Well, that's kind of how he is says that the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. Is he going to win? That's what I just got through saying, no. But he's going to think he did, probably. He's going to think he accomplished a great thing. I'm going to have to make sure that the, the Son of God dies. I'm going to make sure he perishes. I'm going to make sure he has no glorification anymore. It's what he probably might have thought. But at the end of the day, there's nothing he could do because this was the will of God. We never, we never need to forget that aspect of it. The influence of the devil is all over the crucifixion of our Lord, but we also need to remember that the crucifixion was the will of God. Even though wicked men were behind some of it, God's will was still being done. And that's not the only time that we ever find that God uses the will and the desires and the actions of wicked men to bring about His will to pass. When you go back and you study some of the Old Testament prophets, in particular Daniel with Nebuchadnezzar, you'll find some interesting things there that God used old Nebuchadnezzar there for a while, and it could have been the way Nebuchadnezzar reacted. It could very well be that Nebuchadnezzar uh, learned a good lesson and might, might have been one who came, if not converted, close to being in regard to serving God. But, verse 31, that the world may know that I love the Father, and he's established that on more than one occasion, he says it over there in, in verse 23 and 24 about how we show him love. Also verse 15, he talks more about the love that he has for his father in verse 21. He says, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him, and I will manifest myself to him. That's actually the love again from us. My apologies there, uh, but with the father or with the Christ and his love toward us. But here... In verse 31, he talks about the love of his father, or to, to his father. That the world may know that I love the Father. And as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. How did Jesus show the Father he loved him? Same way we show him, by doing what he says. That's right, by being obedient. If ye love me, keep my commandments. It really is that simple. 
And yet so many people want to claim, oh, I love the Lord, oh, I love the Lord, and yet they live their lives in complete opposition to His will. They go about their daily lives engaging in things flippantly and arrogantly that they believe is just going to be ignored apparently or passed over in some way and not held to their account, but if they don't repent, they're in trouble. But Jesus did love his Father, and everything his Father gave him to do, he did it. Even so I do. Oh, I wish we all had that attitude. The Father says it, we do it. God says it, we do it. I'm seeing less and less of that sometimes in society today. Yes, sir, go ahead. There were no doubt some of those who did, yes. As a matter of fact, that's a very good point. They probably thought to a degree that all of this would now be squashed and there wouldn't be any more about it. It would all die out and go away. Now 2,000 years later, we're, here we are, and they didn't win. And the word didn't get squashed and it didn't get stopped. It continued to spread. Well, he should have to a degree, and I'll explain why he should have. Genesis 3.15, where it talked about how that the seed of woman would give that death blow to the serpent. That would have been something he should have already been anticipating. But keep in mind, a lot of time has passed at this moment, too. How much he was thinking about that, I really don't know. But you're right, he, he, was, he was done. I mean, at the end of the day, when Jesus came out of that tomb, he had the power over death, that was it. He won. And there was nothing the devil could do to change that. Not a, not a thing. So Jesus says that he does the Father's will, and then he tells them at the end of verse 31, Arise, let us go hence. Have you ever been walking with someone and y'all have a conversation? That seems what ha is what happens here, that they were talking about things and it's time to get up and go, and they're going to keep on, he's going to keep on talking to them. A lot of what he to, has to do has to be done in the city of Jerusalem. He has to go. And at this occasion, he's going to continue teaching his apostles as they go on their journey on this occasion. So, I am the true vine, he said, verse 1 of chapter 15, and my father is the husbandman. What was a husbandman? Not a wife. No, that's not, that's not it either, though. Today we think about a husband, that's all we think about, right? But what was a husbandman? All right, the idea there of someone who was in, taking care of something. I think you said something like a foreman. He's the idea is he's been entrusted to do a certain work. And a lot of times they talked about that when it had to do with vineyards and things of that nature. And that's what he does here. He says, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. I'm going to say something before we get too deep in this so that we can go ahead and expose the error that is taught sometimes from this segment of Scriptures and know when we get into it that this has nothing to do with what that error it says. There are some people who believe that John chapter 15, beginning at verse 1, and going on down through verse 7, maybe even 8 and 8, teaches the existence and the authority for different denominational bodies. They say Jesus is the true vine, and that all of the branches are the different denominations. Well, first and foremost, that is absolutely false. Jesus did not teach such. Jesus did not encourage such. We know Jesus talked about building His church, Matthew 16, 18. It was not to be divided, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning at verse 10. But if you really want to see how easily this error is defeated, all you have to do is read verse 6. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch. It's not a denominational body, it's an individual man not talking about denominations. When people try to say, well, that's how they're connected to Jesus. He's the true vine and the denominations are the branches, so he's connected to them. Everything's fine. No, that has nothing to do at all with what he taught here. There's nothing about denominationalism in this segment of Scripture anywhere. Not any at all. Every branch, back to verse 2, now that we've cut, covered that, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he, that's the Father, taketh away. He's the husbandman, right? What does it mean to bear not fruit? Well, if a vine is growing somewhere and it doesn't have fruit in, on it, what good really at the end of the day is it? Not a whole lot, right? Jesus is a great vine because of the great fruit that comes by being attached to him. 
The fruit that we are talking about here is the fruit that a child of God produces when he obeys. Every branch in me. Please notice that very carefully. In me. A branch must be in Christ to be connected to the vine. Corey, why are you making such a big deal about that? Go over to Galatians 3, someone, and read verses 26 to the end of the chapter. Galatians 3, beginning at verse 26. Someone who will take that. All right, Brother Jim, go right ahead. Listen carefully. All right, thank you very much. Take a look again at verses 26 and 27. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. You cannot be a child of God outside of Christ Jesus. The only way to be a child of God by faith in Christ Jesus is found in verse 27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. The only way a man gets in Christ is by the action of baptism. Now, that does not demean or lessen the importance of faith. That does not demean or lessen the importance of God's grace. But that is the action that the Bible tells us is the dividing line between being out of Christ and in Christ. You cannot faith into Christ. No matter how much you believe, you cannot faith into Christ. It's not there. You cannot repent into Christ. You can repent unto salvation. You cannot confess into Christ. The only action that puts you in Christ is baptism. That's it. And therefore, we need to understand that no one is a branch connected to the vine who hasn't been baptized. Yes, sir, go ahead. Yes, in this case, in some ways, yes. I don't think he's necessarily dealing completely with leadership here. Uh, in in uh, John 15, he's talking just about the situation about an individual person who's out there serving him and in him doing the will of God. Oh, you're talking about Galatians 3. I'm sorry, I thought you were referencing John 15. No, in Galatians chapter 3 there, when it says there is neither male nor female, uh, I think I've told you all this before. Back when I was a student at the Memphis School of Preaching, one of the requirements we had there was we had to get, take a debate class. And the idea was you learn how, if necessary, so when you get out there as a preacher, you learn how to handle a formal debate if you ever were to have one with someone. But when you do that, you have to have somebody who's preaching and teaching the truth, and then you have to have somebody over here that's he's going to have to preach and teach the error. And he doesn't believe it, he doesn't encourage it, but for that class, he's going to pretend that he believes such, he's going to pretend that he advocates for such as strongly as he can, to help the brother who's teaching the truth be able to answer it in a debate. I had that very thing in debate class, and I had the error. I got up there, and I'm telling you, um, if I wanted to, this is not arrogant, but if I wanted to, I could make that sound pretty good right there and make it sound like women should have leadership roles in the church. I did that that day. I had one brother tell me when it was over with, he sure was glad I was on the right side. <laughs> or something like that, which was, a, I think, as a compliment because I was trying to do the best I could so that the brother who was doing that which was right would have someone to show the error. I wasn't advocating it because I believe it. It was part of the class. But no, that doesn't teach anything about leadership there. That's just talking about how we're equal in Christ. Not in regard to leadership, but in regard to salvation. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Greek, a man or a woman, or a bondman or a freeman. You can all be one in Christ. That's the idea of being united and being part of it. And this is part of that unity in the branch, in the vine. Yes, sir. Well, 
Well, I'm just going to be very honest with you. There are some folks, if it has baptism or baptized or something like that in the verse, you probably are not going to hear them teach very much on it. If, I'm not saying they'll completely always ignore it, but they may not give it much attention. And when they do, they try to... All, it seems like a lot of them, every time they bring some of it up, they try to make it seem like it's not as important as it really is. They try to make it out as something that is secondary, that's really not necessary. And I'm with you. It's easy to understand. I mean... I, I want to be in Christ because I, can't be, I cannot be a child of God outside of Christ. We saw that in Galatians 3.26. I want to be in Christ because I can't be attached to the vine, which is Christ, if I'm not in Him. And the only way I can be in Him, that's location, is to be baptized into Christ. How many of you have ever heard, uh, I think I've done this here before, how many of you uh, have heard the difference between in and into? Y'all know what I mean by that? If someone is jumping in the water, what is he doing? Gets wet? Careful. Jump. If I am jumping in the water, I am literally in the water jumping up and down. But we in the South sometimes don't do as well with our English. But that's literally in the water. How am I baptized into Christ? It's not just the act of being down in there, but it's the act of coming back up as well, and you are a new creature walking in newness of life. There's a difference in doing something in something and being baptized into it. You're, and that's true. You will be submersion, or immersion, you will be submerged. Jesus makes this point. Was, did you say something? I'm sorry. He makes this point in John 15 too. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit he taketh away. Friend, this destroys once saved, always saved. Absolutely shreds it. How, Corey? Jesus says this branch is in him. Who are the ones in Christ that are, what do we say they are sometimes? They are supposed to be the saved ones, right? You have someone here as a branch, though, who's not bearing fruit. The Father takes him away. Can you be lost once you become a Christian? Yes, you can. Now, I don't want to make that sound like you can't, it's hard to get to heaven. At the end of the day, it's not that hard. You just need to be faithful. Walk in the light. When you err, repent. Acknowledge it. Move forward. But someone here in John 15 is not a penitent person. This is one who is in Christ, but now over whatever length of time it has been, he stops bearing fruit. I doubt that it is, I, for most folks, I doubt this would be the first day they're baptized. For most folks, this is a process. And you'll start, sometimes it's hard, hard to watch too, because you can almost see it right in front of you when it's happening. You'll start seeing how they get slack in some areas. They stop doing this, they stop doing that, they stop doing that, they stop doing that, and before long, they just quit the whole thing. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. That's the Father again. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Who are the gardeners in here? Don't expect me to raise my hand. If anybody in the family is able to grow stuff, it's Shelly, it's not I. I am not the gardener. Sometimes you have to take some of it and you have to prune some of it. Because if you don't, it will not be as healthy of a plant as it should be getting the nutrients that it needs. The idea here, every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, he cleanses it, he continues to make it healthy because he's doing the will that he should do and here's the reason that he continues being this way stronger and encouraged to do it because he wants him to do more. That it may bring forth more fruit. Is there ever a time where a Christian can say, I've done enough and I can quit? No. Friend of the day you die, you need to be faithful, Revelation 2.10. Even if it means dying to stay that way, be faithful all the way to the end. And as much as possible, while you're still in physical flesh, continue to serve God and bear fruit. Too. The glory goes to Him, Matthew 5.13-16. Some people might not be able in their advanced years to do some of the things they did when they were younger. But they more than likely, most of them can probably talk on a phone. They can send cards and letters. They can try as best as possible when they're able to be here for worship and encourage people and edify them here. There's still works that can be done. 
and more fruit has to be produced. I can't get back and say, well, I was baptized 50 years ago and I was busy in the Lord's church for 35 of those years. I was really, really busy and I've done enough now. I can just take a break. Friend, there is no retirement age for a Christian. There is none. You say, well, God understands things when we get older. He does. But remember, there remaineth therefore a rest unto the people of God. Our rest is not here. Here we are supposed to be doing the works of Him that sent Christ and the will of Christ and the word of the Holy Spirit while we can. Now ye are clean. Remember, He purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye, He's talking to His apostles, are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. How powerful is the word? All right, let's go over and see. You ever since you referenced that, Hebrews 4.12, someone read it. How powerful is the word of God? Anybody got that? All right, Cindy? All right, thank you very much. I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty powerful to me. You go over to Romans 1.16. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, that's the word of God, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Ye are clean through the word which I have pardon me, spoken unto you. Do you want to be clean in the sight of God? Do the word that Jesus has said. Do the word of God. Abide in Him, verse 4. Abide in Me, and I in you. The only way you can get in Him, obey the Word of God. The only way you can be clean and be purged so that you can bring more fruit is by obeying the Word of God. The only way you're going to be saved is if you obey the Word of God. And when you obey the Word of God, you are in Christ and you are to abide in Him. What does it mean to abide? Sit? What was that? Live, live, okay. Abide. Don't move. I abide at 45 Walden Crossing, northwest. That's where I live. That's what he said, live. That's where I abide. I am supposed to abide in Christ spiritually, and I better not leave. When you leave the Lord, you leave the blessings of the Lord. Abide in me, which again, must continue and I in you. Do you want to have Christ and the Father? Abide in the doctrine. Second John chapter, or chapter, Second John 9 and 10, I believe. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. Ah, interesting statement. Did the Jewish people of the first century understand vineyards well? And how they worked? Yes, they did. Very much so. Very common in that area of the world. A branch cannot bear fruit of itself. It is impossible. It must be attached to the vine for fruit to be made or born. A branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. Abide in the vine. Stay there. Live there. Don't leave there. That's the only way fruit can be produced. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. How many people do you know that are, quote, good people? Friendly people, kind people, helpful people. If they're not in Christ, all of their works are for nothing. Spiritually speaking, that's what it is. Now, I'm not talking physically. I understand you're helping somebody. You're being not... Spiritually speaking, though, those works profit them nothing. Not a bit. If they're not in Christ. Because they're not really bearing fruit the way that He wants, spiritually speaking. You cannot do it except ye abide in Me. And abide, again, you have to continue. You cannot say, I was there at one point, and you have to abide in Him. Stay there. I am the vine, he's mentioned that already, verse 1, 
Ye are the branches. Ye, who's he talking to? Literally here, the apostles. But individual men. He that abideth, that means to continue to abide in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. Don't ever for one moment believe that any of the work you do as a faithful child of God is going unnoticed by our Lord. He knows every single good deed you've done in His name. He knows every good bit of fruit you have borne. He understands all of it. As long as you continue to abide in Him and He in you, you will bring forth much fruit. I don't feel like I do that much. Friends, you don't know sometimes just how much a kind word means to somebody on a certain occasion. I can even go deeper than that with you. You don't know how much just sitting with someone and not saying a word means to some people until you do it sometimes. They just need somebody to listen. But we can bear much fruit in Christ. For without me, that means outside of Him. Remember, it's in Christ. Without here means outside of. For without or outside of me, ye can do nothing. Yes, sir? It does. Yes, sir, it does. And sometimes that's, that's so appreciated is that you didn't come in there and tell them, oh, it's going to be all right, and everything, or he's in a better place, or she's in a better You just were there for them. I saw that they just need to know they're loved and they're thought of. <coughs> for without me or outside of me, ye can do nothing. If, every time I see that word in Scripture, I know a condition is attached to it. If a man... What's a branch then? We talked about earlier, a man. It's not a denominational body. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Remember, if a branch does not bear fruit, the Father takes him away, verse 2. If a man doesn't continue to abide in Christ, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. In other words, he's dying up, he's shriveling up, dying spiritually. And the men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Now, they understood that from a physical point of view. You take the, the withered up, dried out branches that are no good for anything, you burn them. But there's a lot more to this than just a physical branch being burned in a physical fire. This is talking about someone who does not abide in Christ and how much they're going to be punished. We cannot forget what he's getting at here. If a man does not abide in Christ, we've already seen how you get into Christ, we understand how you stay in Christ. He is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. Once saved, always saved is not true. It is not true. Oh, it's a, it's a comforting thought, but it's not true. Who's at fault if I am not abiding in Christ? I am. Has He given me the opportunity to be baptized into Him? Yes, He has. If I am in Christ, whose responsibility is it to stay that way? Still mine. I can't blame anybody else. If I walk away from the Lord, the only person I will have to blame, and, not, and that includes even, the, I won't even be able to blame the devil, is Corey Barnett. Yes. Yes. That's true, yes. That's well, right, yes. At that, moment, at that moment, he says they are clean through the Word. Later on, we know what Judas does, though. And it's certainly not something there that is a great commentary on his life afterwards. Yes, he did. Judas made that choice of his own, just like what I'm saying here. It's not... The only reason Judas did not continue to bear fruit the way it needed to be was because he stopped being faithful to the Lord. So that's a great point because Judas would be included in that number here when he's hearing the vine and the branches. That's a great point. Hellfire and brimstone used to be the norm in some sermons. How much do you hear of it now 
in 2024? Not nearly enough, maybe. Because people have thought it's a, just nothing more than a fantasy. That it's really not a place that you're really going to suffer for eternity. And if it is, it can't be really as bad as it sounds. There are some people who think apparently hell is nothing more than a big rock concert where everybody's sinning. That's what a lot of them think it's going to be like. They're just going to be partying all day long. No. If you abide in me, if, there's that condition again, you can choose not to. Verse 6 proves that. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, my words abide in you, how do I continue to make sure I'm abiding in him? His word is in me. What did the psalmist say? Thy word have I hid in mine heart. What? That I might not sin against thee. Psalm 119.11 If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask, that's the apostles, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Remember who he's talking to. We do not have open-ended requests that can be made to God today the way that they would have. I can't ask for a miracle today and expect it to be done. They could. I can't do that. Why? It's contrary to the will of God today. Those things have ceased, 1 Corinthians 13. But as long as they were abiding in Him and they were being faithful to His Word, they could and it would be done unto them. I, I really am amazed and appreciative when I think about uh, 1 Corinthians 13 of just how much Paul... Uh, understood the greatness of agape love. He even talked about how that he had faith that he could remove mountains, remember? But he had not agape love or charity. To buy, it profited him nothing. I mean, he could, he could do that. He could ask for the mountain to get out of the way for him in the name of Christ. It would move. No, he didn't have big caterpillar work equipment either. It just happened. Herein is my Father glorified. How then? Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. What brings God the glory? What brings the Father glory? A man gets in Christ and bears much fruit, according to the Word of God. Herein, you do that. You abide in Christ. His Word abides in you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. Friend, if you're not working for the Lord, you're working for the devil. It's really that simple. He that is not with me is against me. There are only two sides. You're either a child of God, you're a child of the devil. Those are the only two options. The only way I can be a true disciple of Christ, the only way they could have been, is to abide in Him, continue to abide in Him, be faithful to His Word. Then, much fruit can be born. Up until then, I can do nothing, verse 5, spiritually speaking of bearing fruit. What is a disciple, by the way? Follower, learner, student sometimes, yes. And that's the idea. As the Father hath loved me, did the Father love the Son? Yes, He did. Why? Because He did the Father's will. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. The apostles in particular there, continue ye in my love. That implies something there, doesn't it? How will I be able to, do, if I don't continue to abide in Him, and I don't continue to keep His word, I don't continue in his love. Well, he's already said that in chapter 14. If ye love me, keep my commandments. That's what you'll do. You stop doing what God says. You stop bearing fruit. You're not, you know, no longer a faithful branch attached to the vine. You're out of the love of God. How many people think everybody's going to heaven just because God loves us? You can be outside of the love of God in that regard. Oh, I know God loved the world, so loved the world, John 3, 16, and that's true. But the way we show God our love to Him is we keep His Word. And we continue in His love. If, there it is again. Hmm. I have about a minute and a half. I'm going to try this. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. Simple enough. If, Conditional. What's the other side of that? If I don't keep his commandments, I don't abide in his love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Now name me one thing that the Father wanted him to do, though, that he didn't do. Nothing. What does he want us to do? Everything he tells us to do. Not two-thirds of it, not three-quarters of it. He wants us to know his will, 
and keep it. All right, we'll stop right there for today. Any questions or comments before we're dismissed? Yes, sir. I can't speak to, for that to a degree, uh, his mindset, but I'll say this, he was wrong, terribly wrong. He was there with, uh, in the presence of God, yes. Matter of fact, Job, uh, when you study the book of Job, we'll see him coming with the sons of God there. Uh, yes, at one time he was. He's a strange being, very bitter being, very bitter. All right, thank you for your time.
Well, good morning, everyone. That bell means that it is time for us to begin our worship service here at the Church of Christ at Cartersville. We are so grateful to see each and every one of you out with us this morning. We have a really good number, a lot of uh, familiar faces, and some that are not so familiar. So if you are visiting with us, we do want to welcome you as our special guest, let you know that we are honored by your presence today. And we would ask that if you don't mind, if you have filled out a visitor's card for us, there should be one of those in back of the pew in front of you, just so we've got a record of your attendance and we might send you a note letting you again know how much we, we were glad that you are with us. If you do happen to be looking for a place to attend on a regular basis, we would love to have you join us here at Cartersville. And uh, if you'll hang around a couple of minutes after service, we can talk to you about some of the works that we have going on here and could put you to work in the Lord's kingdom. We will remind everyone of our times of service. On Sunday mornings, we have a 10 o'clock Bible class, and we follow that with our worship service at 11, as we're doing now. We'll come back together this evening at 6 p.m. for our evening worship service. And then on Wednesdays, we do have a midweek Bible study that's at 7.30. And we are having the ladies' Bible class uh, right now, and that is at 10 o'clock on Tuesday mornings, if I remember correctly. Uh, we do want to remind you that if you need a nursery while you're with us, we have one fully equipped uh, for you. If you'll just exit the auditorium, go to your right, you'll find the nursery there. And it is equipped so that you can continue to participate in the worship while you tend to the needs of your young one. Remind everyone to grab a copy of our weekly bulletin. It's the reminder. It is available in the magazine rack on the right as you exit the auditorium. Lots of good information there. Our times of service, our uh, evangelism works, a uh, good article from Brother Corey, not to mention the list of those that are on our prayer list. So lots of good information there. If you'll grab a copy of that, uh, read it, and share it as you see fit. We do have a few additions and updates to our, our prayer list that I'll share with you uh, right now. Uh, Donna Barr, she's not with us today. She's at home with a, a migraine. I, I can appreciate how that feels, and I hope she gets to feeling better very soon. Uh, Linda Gayton, she is at home also with fever and earaches. Hope she gets to feeling well soon. Uh, Brenda Brake, uh, she had a heart attack on Wednesday, and this is a niece of uh, Brother Jerry Bohannon. Trina Bell, she's not with us today. She's not feeling well this morning. morning. Uh, Brianna Bailey, she has uh, surgery that is scheduled on the 22nd of uh, April, and unfortunately the news there is her cancer has spread, so let's certainly keep her in our prayer. Brother Jeff Tompkins, he will be seeing an orthopedic uh, doctor here on, in tomorrow up in Rome. So I hope everything goes well with Brother Tompkins there. Ken Bright, uh, this is a friend of the Williams. He has uh, brain cancer. Also, we got uh, Kelly Chapman. She has surgery scheduled to remove a cyst. This is on Tuesday the 16th. Also, Gabriel Craig, this is one of the little guys that attend with Brother Scott. He is at home with strep. And also, I uh, was just told right before uh, we started that Jeannie Christopher went home uh, during Bible study not feeling well. So let's certainly keep all of these in our thoughts and in our prayers and, and do for them as we have the opportunity. A couple of other things we want to make you aware of. We've got several events going on in the area that we want to make folks aware of. The uh, gospel meetings, the Martin Luther King congregation up in Adairsville. They will be having their meeting the 21st through the 24th. This is with David Wright as the guest speaker there. Uh, Riverbend, they'll be having a ladies' day on the 27th of April. Tiffany Gaines will be the speaker there. Also, West Argonne will be having a ladies' day also on the 27th. Don't know the speaker there. And uh, Ella J will be having their spring uh, meeting the 28th through the 1st. So lots of opportunities uh, for worship in the area. But the most important one for us is our Congregational Evangelism Seminar beginning the 19th through the 21st. 
Uh, Brother uh, Charles Harris will be leading that for us, and we'll start the events there Friday the 19th at 7 p.m. We've got events uh, Saturday, 5 p.m., 6 p.m., Sunday, 10 a.m., 11 a.m., potluck meal immediately after morning services, 1.30 service on Sunday, uh, two separate ones there, one for the men, one for the ladies, and then a 2.30 uh, uh, leadership session, and then we'll have our regular worship service at 6 p.m. So all of that, there's a uh, agenda back in the back in the magazine rack if you want to grab a copy of that, and there's also a copy of the flyer for that seminar uh, back on the bulletin board. So let's mark our calendars for that and, and make the appropriate arrangements to be here and bring anyone that uh, you think might be interested in hearing what Brother Charles has to share with us. Uh, the Parkers, they are out of town today visiting over in Atlanta, or Atlanta, Alabama. Yeah, see there's a mental block there, don't want to talk about Alabama, but that's where they are. Um, in association with the evangelism uh, seminar on the back tables on the left side as you go out the auditorium there are some sign-up sheets and those sign-up sheets are for the potluck meal on Sunday and uh, believe it or not fried chicken is already on the list but anyway take a moment put your name on the list bring something good because I like good food and I will appreciate that as well will everyone else uh, there are still some directories available. If you hadn't got your copy of that yet, just look on the back tables. Um, we also have a note here from the uh, Good Neighbor Homeless Shelter that they want to express their appreciation uh, for the recent donation from the congregation and said that the food and the clothes and the items were very greatly needed. Um, also, in association with our bulletin, if you have any, as you look over it, if you have any changes that need to be made there, any deletions or updates, just please let Brother Doug know uh, so that we can keep the information in the bulletin as timely as possible. I believe that is all the announcements that I have uh, this morning. If you need anything added or changed, if you'll just let me know, we'll be sure we get that corrected uh, before this evening's service. With that, let us enter into our worship service with our song service. Good morning. Our opening song this morning will be number 65. Number 65. If I should happen to fall asleep while I'm leading singing, would someone please come up here and gently wake me back up? Thank you. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, where rivers of pleasure I see. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, the shadows of dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his blood, and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord, he taketh my burden away. He hideth me up and I shall not be moved, he giveth me strength as my day. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, the shadows of dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand, and covers me there with his hand. When clothed in his brightness, transported I rise to meet him in clouds of the sky. His perfect salvation, his wonderful love, I'll shout with the millions on high. 
He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. Good morning. I'll be reading out of the New King James Version. I believe it's 1 Timothy chapter 3. Beginning in verse 1. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires good work. A bishop must be blameless, a husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, and good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, nor violent, nor greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, or covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the house of God? Not a novice, that's being puffed up with pride, he falls into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have good, a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he falls into reproach in the snare of the devil. Shall we pray? Our dear kind and loving Father, we thank you for being the almighty God that you are. Father, we thank you for the night of rest which we have received to prepare ourselves to worship thee. Father, we thank you for the beautiful day you have blessed us with. We see your created hand in all things with the flowers and the bloom. Father, we thank you for being our God. Father, as we approach your throne this morning, we come with humble hearts. Father, we pray that our worship will be pleasing and acceptable in thy sight. Father, we pray for the men who are taking part in the worship this morning. We pray that all that we think, say, and do is pleasing to thee. Father, thank you for all the good things, for all good comes from thee, your son. We thank you, Father, for him and what he had done for us. For he was willing to take our iniquities to that cross and suffer the pain that we should suffer. Thank you, Father, for the greatest gift of all. And Father, we thank you for your love for us, your grace and your mercy. Father, we thank you for our elders as we will be studying more upon our overseers this morning and their qualifications. We pray that you would be with Brother Herring and Brother Woodring as they go through the process of finding men that are qualified for the position of being an elder. We pray, Father, for them. We pray that they would make good judgment upon those who they choose. Father, we pray for good health for our elders, good health for our deacons, and the work that our deacons do, we appreciate very much. Father, we pray for Brother Corey as he brings us another portion of thy word, that we'd listen attentively, that we'd apply and study these things that will be before us this morning. And Father, perhaps one day, we as men can be elders, we as men can be deacons, in this congregation here. Father, we thank you for Corey and his abilities. We appreciate him and his family very much. Father, we thank you for the ladies of this great congregation and the cards that they do send and the love that they have for each and every one of us. We thank you, ladies. 
And Father, we are grateful that you have blessed us with wonderful ladies in this congregation. And Father, we are a blessed congregation to have the love that flows in this congregation. We thank you for hearing our prayers. And Father, we know you'll answer them in the way that you know best, that we would be patient in the things that are before us. And Father, we thank you for the prayers upon behalf of my family. Father, we thank you for the blessings in life. We realize that sometimes, Father, we could be at fault, and we ask you to forgive us for those things that we do wrong, that we would overcome them before it's too late. Father, we thank you for the men and women of our military who keep us protected from outside invasions. We pray that they'd have all things that necessity for life. We pray for our first responders. We pray that as they go to work, Father, that they would be mindful of the things that they are doing and that we would be mindful as we pass them on the side of the road. We are mindful of the men and women, Father, who work with our roads, our bridges, and infrastructure, that as we go through their work zones, that we all slow down. We have no rush to get there or get to work. Father, we thank you for the many blessings. We pray for the sick. Many have been announced as being sick and afflicted. Many have problems, many have issues. And we pray, Father, that these infirmities will be gone soon with them and that you'd be with the caretakers who take care of them. Father, we thank you for this Lord's day. We thank you for life. And we pray, Father, that as we worship thee in truth and in spirit, that it will be pleasing and acceptable to thee for our goal and our challenges to get to heaven on that final day. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for hearing our prayers. For this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Next hymn this morning is number 877, 877. Sweet is the song I am singing today, I'm redeemed, I'm redeemed, trouble and sorrow have vanished away, I have been redeemed, I'm redeemed by love divine. Glory, glory, Christ is mine, Christ is mine. All to him I now resign. I have been redeemed. Great is my joy, now as onward I go. I'm redeemed. I'm redeemed All the way homeward My praises shall flow I have been redeemed I'm redeemed By love divine Glory, glory, Christ is mine Christ is mine all to him I now resign. I have been redeemed. Precious indeed is my Savior to me. I'm redeemed, I'm redeemed. Happy in glory. Someday I shall be. I have been redeemed. I'm redeemed.
redeem by love divine. Glory, glory, Christ is mine, Christ is mine. All to him I now resign. I have been redeemed. This time, if you'd like to go ahead and mark the hymn of encouragement, which will be number seven, uh, excuse me, number 436, number 436, when the invitation is extended this morning. Once you have that marked, if you'll turn with me to number 742, 742. If you're able at this time, would you stand with me, please? Seeking the lost, yes, kindly entreating, wanderers on the mountain astray. Come unto me, his message repeating, words of the Master speaking today. Going afar upon the mountain, bringing the wanderer back again into the fold of my Redeemer, Jesus the Lamb for sinners slain. Seeking the lost and pointing to Jesus, souls that are weak and hearts that are sore, Leading them forth in ways of salvation, showing the path to life evermore. Going up all, bringing the wanderer back again into the fold of my Redeemer. Jesus the Lamb for sinners slain. Thus I would go on missions of mercy, following Christ from day unto day, cheering the saints and raising the fallen, pointing the lost to Jesus the way. Going afar upon the mountain, bringing the wanderer back again into the fold of my Redeemer, Jesus the Lamb for sinner slain. Be seated, please. Now, Brother Barnett. I hope that many of you recall back in February that I preached a sermon on who are elders and what do they do. Today we're going to follow that with another sermon about elders, and that is the question, why do we need them? In the process of time, elderships change. They're not always going to be the same. Some are going to age, some are going to die. Some are going to move and no longer be a part of a congregation. And therefore, the need will arise when those situations happen for the congregation to seek out other men or but already have done that so that when the time comes, there will be no lapse in an eldership. I have been in congregations where there have not been elderships. They can exist in a scriptural way within reason 
But it should only be a temporary state at best. God wants elders in congregations. It's not a matter of, well, if we feel like it, maybe one day we'll have them. It is an imperative that if we are able, we should have them. And we need to make sure we understand the great need that exists for men to be elders. I say men because that's the very first qualification. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. This is a true saying, if a man desireth or desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. I know that this is not just talking about a human being in general, but rather a male human being. For verse 2 says that a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. And contrary to what some would have us to believe today, a woman cannot be a husband of one wife. It does not work that way. This is not something that was just for the first century, and then in the 21st century, man would get enlightened, and man would be uh, able to discern better, maybe he thinks in his mind, and change that to where women can now be in the elderships. That is wrong. Friends, there is no authority for ladies to serve in this capacity. That's not meant to be anything against a lady per se. It's just not the role that God expects from her. She was not to have dominion over the man when she was created, but was rather taken out of man and made a woman. A man needs to desire the office of a bishop, not for selfish reasons. It should not be so that he can have run of the congregation the way he wants things to be. But the desire should be that he can serve in this capacity and be a betterment for the congregation of the Lord's people. It is indeed a good work. Blameless sometimes causes people some problems. And they think, well, that must mean that he has to be without sin. No, that's not the case, for we all sin and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3, 23. To be unimpeachable is the idea that you cannot bring up an accusation against him that will stick. If he's done things wrong, he makes it right. If he is uh, living in a way that he finds is in con uh, contrast with the Word of God, he corrects it. Yes, he must be a married man and not a polygamist. One wife. That does not mean that a man whose wife has previously passed and made him a widow... When he remarries, that does not mean that he is automatically disqualified because he is not the husband of two wives. He is still the husband of one wife. The first wife is no longer there. Marriage ends at death, Romans 7, 1 through 4. He needs to be vigilant. He needs to be busy. He needs to be sober. He needs to be clear-headed. He needs to have good behavior. Makes common sense. <laughs> He needs to be a hospitable man. That he will welcome people into his home. That he will do for them as he has opportunity. He must be able to teach. No, that doesn't mean that he just can do it, but that he's able and that he can do it. He needs to be one who's willing to do it. Not given to wine. Not a drunkard. Not a partaker of alcoholic beverages. No striker. Doesn't need to be the type of man who's always trying to cause problems and start fights. Not greedy of filthy lucre. He's not a covetous, greedy person. But patient, enduring, steadfast. Not a brawler, not quarrelsome, not covetous. Not one who lusts after things that are not his. He needs to rule well his own house. As the head of that home, he needs to make sure he has his children in subjection with all gravity. Please notice that he must have children. I will go ahead and make a point of that, though. That means offspring. It does not denote that there must be two or more. Some will say, well, children in the English language is plural, and that is true, but we use it in a different way sometimes. Says, well, ask me how many children I have on this earth. I would say one. Now, I have another one that's in paradise, but I have one that's on this earth. The reason that I make a point of that is there are some people who think a man can't be an elder if he doesn't have a plurality of children. It just simply means offspring. Whatever offspring he has, they need to be in subjection unto him with all gravity, reverence. 
true, if he doesn't know how to rule his own house, how is he going to take care of the church of God? He won't. He doesn't need to be one who's a novice, an unlearned one. He needs to know the book. No, that does not mean he can quote every verse from memory, but rather he understands what is contained in the Word, knows how to find what is in there, knows how to use it properly. He doesn't need pride. Pride goeth before destruction, and the Holy Spirit before a fall. He needs to have a good reputation of those people outside of the church. They need to see that he is a decent person in his, commu- in his regular way of life, in his business dealings, in the way that he does with his family. He needs to make sure all of those things are met in his life, or friend, he's not qualified to be an elder. Now, that's what you find in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Titus also mentions in Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 9, that the eldership needs to be of a plurality, not singularity. For this cause I left thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders, plural, in every city as I had appointed thee. That's what Titus was told to do. Not just one bishop, not just one overseer, not just one presbyter, not just one pastor, not just one shepherd, but plural. And it's left in that regard. It doesn't tell us how many in the plural. It can be two. It could be 20, depending on the size of the congregation and the qualifications of the men. But there must be more than one. I believe that shows the great wisdom of God. Diotrephes loved to have the preeminence. John talked about how he thought he actually could, Diotrephes thought he could actually kick people out of the congregation or choose who could be parts of it. We don't need men in the eldership who think that way. If any man be blameless, again, not sinless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, his children need to be ones that are decent in the way they behave. And they need to be faithful to him and faithful to the Lord. He must be blameless. And it tells us why. Because he's the steward of God. A steward is one who has been entrusted with the care of someone else's possession. Well, in this case, the church belongs to Christ. Not self-willed. This person does not have to have his way all the time. This person is not trying to go about making things the way he wants it for his own purposes. Not soon angry. Notice it doesn't say not angry. We all have moments of anger. Even our Lord did. But there's a difference in having a moment of righteous indignation and there's another way of living out a life of anger that is unhealthy. He doesn't need to be soon angry. He needs to be the way that Paul said that he doesn't let the sun go down upon his wrath. And he does not sin with his anger. When he does, he corrects such. Not given to wine. Again, he's no drunkard, no striker. He's not a physical, looking for physical altercations. Not given to filthy lucre. He's not doing it just so he can gain money and wealth. He's a lover of hospitality. He shows that to his, fa- to his congregation over which he works. Or over the congregation which he works. A lover of good men. An interesting way of putting that. The ones he wants to be around, the people he wants to associate with, the people that he admires are good men. Clear-headed, sober, just, wants justice, wants things to be fair and right, holy, pure, temperate, has self-control. And he must be able to hold fast the faithful word as he has been taught. Like I said, they need to be men of the book. And the reason for that is that, by, that they can, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and convince what the Bible calls gainsayers. There are your qualifications, friends. I've went over all of them, so I made sure that we covered that. Because that, my friend, is what God wants. And that is why we need elders. God is not the author of confusion. I know that the context of 1 Corinthians 14, 33 was dealing with the spiritual gifts, the miraculous abilities, and how that people were misusing them. 
But when it gets right down to it, God is not the author of confusion in more than one way. God is not one who wants disorder. God wants things to be done decently and in order. 1 Corinthians 14, 40. And therefore, he wants elders to oversee the congregations. If there is disorder in a congregation, there will be many problems. If the congregation are left to their own devices, there will be many problems. God does not want those problems, and therefore, in His wisdom, elders are needed. The congregation is supposed to obey the elders. Hebrews 13, 17, Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves. Submission means you lower your will down and are willing to accept what the will of the eldership is, so long as it doesn't violate God's will. I know these are elders because of the latter part of that verse, for they, the ones we are to obey and submit to, watch for your souls. Those are elders. They're the only ones who would fit that classification. As they that must give account, friend, their job is a serious one. I'm going to be very honest and blunt with you. That one right there makes me uneasy. Because I know on the day of judgment, Corey Barnett is going to have to give an account of the things done in his body, whether they be good or bad. But elders not only go and give an account of themselves, they have the responsibility of each member of that congregation of whether or not they oversaw and took care of that flock the way that God wants them to. Oh no, they, they are not going to get in heaven because of the elder alone. They're going to have to do their own obedience. But what a, what a great requirement God places on these men. Without elders, that disorder would continue to spread. With elders, we can have order. When we submit and we obey them as we are taught to do in Scriptures, we do it in a way that they can serve with joy and not with grief. I assure you, friend, if you've ever been around an eldership at any length of time that has served God faithfully, you will understand and you will appreciate just how much grief they endure. They already have enough problems to deal with on a regular basis than me making more for them. For that is unprofitable for you. It doesn't help us to cause more problems for them. We need them because that is God's will. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning at verse 12, And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. Those are elders. They're the only ones over which, or, uh, under which we find ourselves in the Lord, in the, in the church. Of course, Christ being the head, we, we, we are not speaking of that in regard to the relationship with Him. We're talking about here in a congregational setting. Notice not only that, they labor amongst us and they admonish us. Sometimes they're going to have to tell us when we're wrong. And we need to be grown up and mature enough Christians that when they do, we understand they're trying to help us, not hurt us, and they're, they're trying to make sure we can go to heaven. And in verse 13 of 1 Thessalonians 5 says that we are to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Some people may not agree with this, but being a preacher has some difficulties. Believe it or not, preachers from time to time have people that don't like what they preach. <laughs> from time to time, preachers will have some people say, well, he was too long-winded today. And those are just sometimes small matters. I understand that. I say that because people sometimes do, though, think that preachers must have a rough time with some things, and sometimes we do. But friends, I'm going to tell you right now, the work and the labor that an eldership that is faithful to God does, they deserve to be esteemed very highly in love for their work's sake because they do so much that many times some people don't even know. If they come to you and they have to talk to you about you or your family, don't get bitter with them. Understand that they are like a shepherd who loves them the sheep. And if he sees the sheep is in trouble or he sees the sheep is in danger, he comes to protect it and to help it and to nurture it. 
esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. I don't always give you my opinion on everything, especially when I'm behind this pulpit. But I will go ahead and throw out there that this is something that you can agree or disagree with, but I do not believe there is a higher office than any man can ever hold than that of an elder or a bishop in the Lord's kingdom. Yes, that includes political fields and such like. We need elders because that's God's will. And without elders... I mentioned how he's like a shepherd with the sheep. That's exactly the way it is described in 1 Peter chapter 5. We need elders because if we don't have shepherds, we're like sheep without them who wander off and go astray. The elders which are among you, I exhort who am also an elder. This was Peter. He was an apostle and an elder both. And a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Here's what the elders were being told by this elder. Feed the flock of God. Why do we need elders? Because the flock needs fed. You don't feed a group of sheep, what's going to happen to them? They're going to be malnourished and they're going to die. If congregations do not have adequate spiritual nutrition, they will die. Feed the flock of God which is among you. It's an autonomous thing. So each congregation has its own elders. Taking the oversight thereof. You do not wait until they give you the reins. You go ahead and you take that responsibility and make sure that you do it properly. Not by constraint. Don't get forced into it. Don't do it just because somebody has pressured you into it. But willingly. Not for the filthy lucre. Same thing we saw earlier but of a ready mind. What do you mean, but of a ready mind? You are ready to do the Lord's will and serve in this area, and you are not going to let something like that keep you from it. You're not in it for the money. Neither is being lords over God's heritage. There's a hierarchy in the kingdom of Christ. A monarch, an absolute monarch, Jesus, the King of kings. Serving under him are the elderships of the congregations. They are shepherds. They are in service to the good chief shepherd. And then, when they understand that they're not lords over God's heritage, they're not trying to make it all about themselves, and they're not trying to rule with an iron fist against what God wants done, they are to be examples to the flock. Sadly, there are some people who take the latter part of that verse and try to say that's the only area in which elders have authority is just to be examples. That's not true. Are they to be examples to the flock? Yes, but is that the only thing they have over which they have authority? No. We've already seen Hebrews 13, 17. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Friends, the elders want to go to heaven too. <laughs> The elders want that crown of life too. And it's going to help them to get there if you help them by doing the Lord's will yourself. If you don't have shepherds over the sheep, they run amok. I don't mean this ugly, but sometimes sheep don't act like they're very intelligent. Please don't take that as an insult. But sometimes they don't act like they're very intelligent. They'll wander off and get in a dangerous position before you know it, and they're trapped or caught or killed. Yes, sometimes even the church is that way. Sometimes we wander off, and before we know it, we've been caught in the snare of the devil. That's what we saw earlier as well. Number two, not only do we need elders because it is God's will, but we need elders because of the need for spiritual nourishment. I just touched on that. They are to feed the flock of God. It is not the preacher's responsibility to feed the flock of God. That may surprise some people. It is the responsibility of the elders. Now, do the preachers and congregations help that work? Yes. Are they a part of that work? Yes, under the elders' authority. And therefore, the elders have any right at any time to come to me and say, Corey, we want you to preach on this matter from the Bible this coming Sunday, next Sunday, a month from now, or whenever it may be. And you know what I should do? I should readily accept such and do it. They may know of a need in the congregation more than I do. They feed the flock. 
Sometimes they'll do that literally. They may mount the pulpit. They may preach a sermon. They may take a, a position behind a podium and teach a class themselves. They may do that by proxy, having someone like a preacher be preaching from the pulpit or teaching from a class. Either way, the responsibility is theirs. That means they have to be careful who they let teach and who they let preach. Because when you let in a wolf in sheep's clothing, he'll do everything he can to devour the sheep. We need to be nourished. We need to be fed. They take care of that. In Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 through 14, there were some individuals there, unfortunately, who hadn't grown the way they should. He said, For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. And become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. They should have been fed and grown better by now. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. The elders have that responsibility to help us grow, to help us be nourished. That's a problem in the Lord's kingdom today. There are a lot of congregations who are spiritually malnourished. And part of that problem either lies in the, in the fact that there are no elders or else maybe those elders have not done their jobs the way God wanted them to do. Friends, congregation will never be as strong as they can be without the proper diet. You don't take care of the physical body. It will never be as strong as it needs to be. The diet that you eat, the things you put in your body, they're going to make them either better or worse. The same is true in regard to the church. If we are not giving the proper diet, we're going to be in trouble, spiritually speaking, 2 Timothy 4, 2, what did preachers get told there by a particular Timothy? Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. The idea there is the diet needs to be a healthy one of God's word. That's why earlier I said I'm, I don't usually give opinions, especially when I'm behind a pulpit. That's not the place nor the time, most of it, in regard to opinions. It's, it's the word of God. So we need elders because it is God's will. We need elders because we need to be spiritually nourished. And number three, we need elders because of the threat of error, the threat of false teachers, and disobedient brethren. There are all three of those things present in the world today. All three of them. You remember that one of the things that Titus said, or Paul said to Titus, rather, excuse me, was that these elders needed to be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Those are not the ones who are on the side of God. Those are the ones working against Him. They need to know whether or not a wolf has come amongst us. I am grateful for our elders here. In the process that I had when I became preacher here, the preacher here, they had a survey or a questionnaire, I guess is more accurate, that they wanted me to fill out before they just let me get in a pulpit or, mount, or get into class and start teaching. They made sure where I stood on spiritual matters and scriptural matters so that I did not come into a congregation and I did not hurt it. How many times have you heard me say, when you've told me it's a good sermon or something along the line, what do I say sometimes? I hope it helps. But the elders are the ones who make sure that the wolves don't come in and destroy us. As a matter of fact, did you know sometimes they even have to do that amongst themselves? Acts 20, beginning at verse 28, 28, Take heed therefore unto yourselves. He's talking to the elders in Ephesus, or elders of Ephesus. Back to verse 17. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit hath made you overseers to feed the church of God. Again, it's their responsibility, which he hath purchased with his own blood, but please notice the next two verses. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Sometimes there are some men who get into the eldership who should not be there. That's why it is so important that we understand the qualifications and that they are met. Because if not, wolves will come in and not spare the flock, 
also of your own selves. Yes, in the eldership shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, watch and remember, verse 31, that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. How serious did Paul take it? Very. If we're not careful, error will be spread. If we're not careful, false teachers will get an audience. And if we're not careful, disobedient brethren will never be disciplined. And that brings us to the final things. Sometimes the elders, when they watch for our souls, may have to be the ones who lead in disciplining that erring brother. We would love in the Lord's kingdom for every member of the body of Christ to remain faithful and go to heaven. That should be the desire of all of us. But we should not be so naive as to believe that there are not some brethren who go astray. And when they go astray, we need to submit to the elders' leadership. We need to obey the elders' leadership when they engage in the disciplining process of disobedient brethren. Sadly, that's not always the case. Three reasons this morning. Didn't realize how long it had been up here. Three reasons this morning that we need elders. It's God's will. That we need spiritual nourishment. We need fed. And because there's a threat of error, false teachers, and disobedient brethren, and we need to make sure those things are handled. So why is it, if the need is so great, why is it that so many congregations have no elders? Or they have very few, if any at all. And some of that falls on the congregation's shoulders. Some of it. Sometimes congregations have unrealistic expectations of the men. They're not sinlessly perfect, they're blameless. If we're waiting on men to be sinlessly perfect, we will never have elders. Please let that sink into our minds. If we're waiting for them to be sinlessly perfect all the days of their lives, we're never going to have elders. They're going to sin just like we do. 1 John chapter 1, verses 6-10. through 10. Some congregations are afraid to appoint men because they don't want to put someone in the eldership that shouldn't be there. I understand that and I appreciate that. But friends, if the qualifications are met and the need is there, we ought to have men overseeing the work. Sometimes there's not elders in every congregation simply because men don't desire the work. The desire should be to help the Lord's kingdom to serve our Lord faithfully. And then there are some times because men just don't feel adequate enough to do it. Friend, I guarantee you, an elder worth his salt and worth his weight in gold understands he is inadequate in a lot of ways. But that doesn't mean that he shouldn't serve when he's called to do such. We all sin. Romans 3, 23. So I have preached in the last couple of months who are elders and what do they do. I have preached this morning on why do we need elders and we've seen three great reasons. And if the church is going to be as good and strong as we want it to be, we need elders in each congregation. If there are obstacles that are in the way of men being appointed, then the congregation should be active in preparing and teaching the men of the next generation so they can get there and make sure the next generation does. I know this sermon was not one that tells us how to become a Christian, but friend, we need to understand that we only are blessed to have elders because they have obeyed the gospel in their own lives at one point. They became children of God. They wanted the remission of sins. They wanted to go to heaven. I hope you do too. Because of what Jesus did in coming to this world and dying on the cross, being buried, risen again the third day, and ascending back to the Father to rule over His kingdom, we can have that hope. But we must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ or we'll die in our sins, John 8, 24. We must repent of our past sins or we'll perish, Luke 13, 5. We must be willing to confess our faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, Acts 8, 37. And we must be immersed in water baptized for the remission of our sins. That's where we contact Christ's blood. The old man of sin goes down, is buried after being crucified, and he rises up a new creature, walking in newness of life. He's been born again. Romans 6, 3 through 4. 
And friend, if you stay faithful after doing that, guess what? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of thy Lord. If you are an unfaithful child of God, please come back home. The Lord wants you. We want you. We'll help you as best as we can. You have to repent. Acknowledge your transgression, 1 John 1, and pray for forgiveness, Acts chapter 8. We'll be glad to pray with you if that's your desire. If you'd like to respond, come now and together we stand. of the Lord's Supper, let us turn to number 762, number 762. Yeah. 
thy mercy send me sorrow, toil, and woe, or should pain attend me on my path below. Grant that I may never fail thy hand to see. Grant that I may never cast my care on When we think of our Savior's suffering, we usually think of the terrible scourging and the nails driven through his hands and feet. But let us not forget the less obvious factors, such as his extreme thirst. The human body requires large amounts of water to replace lost blood. Jesus had lost much blood due to the scourging and crucifixion, not to mention the crowns of thorns the soldiers pounded on his head. Five pairs of arteries are located in the scalp, and if you ever had a cut on your scalp, you know how profusely it bleeds. His thirst would be further intensified by fever from the trauma of scourging and crucifixion, along with any infection from the wounds. Yet his most recent intake of fluids was the previous night at the Last Supper. Jesus' thirst fulfilled Psalm 2215, my tongue clings to my jaws. He was so dehydrated that, he, that even his saliva had dried up. In response to his cry, someone put a sponge of sour wine to his lips. Previously, he had been offered sour wine mixed with gall but had refused it probably because gall had a mild pain-killing quality. Here the gall is absent. Jesus, Jesus endured the full brunt of the pain to atone for our, for our sins. Let us remember him as we eat and drink the cup. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Almighty God, we're so thankful to thee and for all the blessings you give us. and We're so thankful, Father, for your Son who you sent to this earth to teach us your ways and to give us a way of remission of our sins. As we partake of this bread, let us look back to that day that he suffered for us on that cruel cross of Calvary. For all these things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>
Church, I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I do, I do know who holds tomorrow. With that being said, let us give thanks for the cup. Our God and our Father, which are in heaven, we're so thankful for this day and we're thankful for life. We're thankful for this opportunity to be here on this day and this place at this time to participate in this memorial. We come now on behalf of this cup, which represents the shed blood of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray, Heavenly Father, that those of us that partake of will take up with clean hands and pure hearts. For it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. That concludes the Lord's Supper. Now, now it's time to give back. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the many blessings of life that we have. and We're so thankful, Father, we live in a country we do that we can go out and earn an income, supply our needs for our family. And now, Father, it's time to give back a portion which is right for thine. And we pray that the funds used here will be to, to further the work of the church. These things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Again, it is great to see everyone who's out with us today. It is a very beautiful day, this first day of the week. And to those that are visiting with us, we appreciate your visit. And we uh, invite and encourage you to be back with us at any and every opportunity that you may have. And if anyone does have any questions at all, please don't hesitate to uh, ask us before you leave. Corey, we certainly uh, appreciate that lesson. It goes hand in hand with the... Uh, announcement that we did make 
last week, but uh, before I reference that, uh, one of the initial points that uh, Corey brought up or uh, before he got into the main points was talking about things changing. People, some grow old and die. Well, I think we all grow old and die. Um, we all know that uh, life is full of a lot of change, but it, in Malachi 3, verse 6, we read, For I am the Lord, I change not. And God's plan and his design for the church is established and will remain until Christ gives the church back up at the end. So let's keep that in mind. And Cor did reference the idea of growing there in Hebrews chapter 5. And I thought of 2 Peter 3 and verse 18, for we are to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So we know we all have that command that need that we must grow and so think about that as we put all that together but yes we uh we announced uh, last sunday we are proceeding in the process of uh, appointing additional elders at this time but we are seeking input from the congregation here if you know of men who are you feel are qualified Please talk with them. Please talk with them and find out that and find out if they do have that desire to serve. But we also included deacons along with that. Corey did not reference that this morning, but he covered the qualifications there, the elders. But look at the qualifications of the deacons as well. First Timothy chapter 3, verses uh, 8 through 12. And uh, hopefully in down the road at some point we may add additional deacons but we will be thinking about that too so uh if you will do that and uh get back with us uh next sunday the 21st uh one more week is where we had uh, requested that if you would get that information to us we would certainly appreciate it also don't forget this afternoon three o'clock uh tabitha class for the young ladies they'll be meeting and then we'll be back this evening at uh, six Begin with kids sing, and then we will have our evening worship. Also look for the visitation cards there on the back table. We appreciate that. Friday night, what is Friday night? Friday night, the 19th, seven o'clock. The topic is let's get motivated. So we'll find out more after that, but be here Friday night for the evangelism seminar. We'll get started with that. Hope everyone has a great afternoon. If you'll be standing, we'll have a closing song and a closing prayer. Closing song will be number 22, number 2-2. Two, two. Be with me, Lord, I cannot live without Thee. I dare not try to take one step alone. I cannot bear the load of life unaided. I need thy strength to lean myself upon. Be with me, Lord, and then if dangers threaten, if storms of trial burst above my head, if flashing seas sleep everywhere about me, they cannot harm or make my heart afraid. Be with me, Lord, no other gift or blessing thou couldst bestow could with this one compare. A constant sense of thy abiding presence Where'er I am to feel that thou art near Be with me, Lord, when loneliness o'ertakes me When I must weep 
amid the fires of pain. And when shall come the hour of my departure for worlds unknown? O Lord, be with me then. Will you bow with me? Our dear God and most gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this beautiful Lord's Day and for this opportunity we've had to come together to offer our worship unto Thee. Pray that our worship this morning has been found acceptable on Thy side. We're so thankful for the many bountiful blessings that You've given unto us. We're so thankful for the strength and the health You've given us. and We're so thankful for the opportunity You've given us to come together to worship Thee. We pray that You'll be with us, help us to take Thy word with us as we depart from here. Pray that You'll watch over us and bring us back again this evening to study another portion of Thy blessed word. We ask you at this time to watch over the many of our congregation, our family who are sick. Pray, be Thy will, return them to their strength and their health once again. I ask you to watch over us, be with those who are not here this morning. Pray that you'll be with them. Pray that you'll help us to bring them back with us once again. Watch over us. Be with us. Forgive us of our sins and our shortcomings. Watch over us. Keep us safe. Ask in Christ's name. Amen. <laughs>